think about the nature of remembrances. And I really think about the nature of the generation in which we occupy our time at the present. And I don't know about you, but if I'm not careful, I can look at the world around me and become very jaded, almost cynical, when I start looking at trends of the generation of present day and age. And I see things and I step back and I ask myself, is that really the way it needs to be? Is that really the way it ought to be? Is that really the way it should be? A couple from Poland were traveling in Argentina. They positioned themselves in a very precarious place in order that they might be able to snap a selfie. It sort of has become the nature of any significant moment in which we occupy. We see some beautiful scenic view, and we think that view would look better if my face were in it. You know, I want to be positioned along Mount Rushmore, right? This couple from Poland had their two children, six and four years old, with them. The mother and dad crossed a barrier that had been erected in order to keep individuals away from certain terrain of this beautiful landscape. As a result of crossing the barrier, they stood believing this will be the right spot to gain the best view of our picture, of our selfie. And when they snapped the picture, they took one wrong step, and both of them plunged to their death. The children were placed in the custody of Polish authorities, traumatized by seeing and witnessing the death of their parents. Really, it becomes almost a metaphor, I think, for a present-day generation. If we are not careful as a people, we'll be consumed with really only focusing on ourselves and not looking at the broader picture of life around us and not looking in many respects beyond us. The Bible always has carried a theme of the generations. The Bible has always carried a theme about how one generation has a responsibility, yea, a duty, to the next generation. And that responsibility is encapsulated in understanding you must equip and train them to deal with the challenges they will face. It's what you heard when Moses called upon Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You shall teach these commandments to your children. You'll talk about them when you rise up and when you lie down, when you go into the city and when you come out, when you walk by the wayside. Literally, in every moment of life, you will speak of these things. Why? Because the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is undivided. And if God is undivided in the way that He interacts and deals with you and me, then we so also must be undivided in the way that we interact with Him. But too many of our lives today are diluted. They're diluted in the way in which we deal with God. We'll set aside time on special occasions or special events or certain moments or highlights throughout the year. And we think in those moments makes the difference with our relationship with God. But genuinely throughout the generations, his plea has always been, give me everything that you have to offer because that is the way I have always regarded you with all that I am. I think about the nature of days gone by and the generations around us. How is it that we can see the impact of faith for 150 years to come? You've seen the nature of a faith that has been shared for the last century and a half. And what kind of resolute option do we place in our heart? Here's how we want to carry out life. And here's what we want to do in our days. Jerry was kind to mention that we've transitioned work in the last year, leaving behind a family that we grew to love and cherish for a decade in the great community of Centerville, working now with another great beacon church, the Walnut Street Congregation in Dixon. And as our work with Fried Hardeman University in Dixon at the Renaissance Center continues, we are blessed to be a part of that work. A year ago tomorrow, 
precious woman who was dear to our family, Mrs. Sammy Elrod, will mark the anniversary of her death and her passing. Mrs. Elrod had a phenomenal mind. She was a woman of exquisite grace. She was a woman who, if you visited well into her 90s, she would pick up the conversation from the moment when you had last been together and parted. She was not interested in merely recollecting or dwelling on the past, but rather she was keenly focused on the present and on what the future might look like. However, she had a rich and storied history that if you were to press her, she would share and she would offer. She was a woman of great knowledge as it pertained to the world of nature around her. I told her one time in visiting her, Mrs. Elrod, there is a woodpecker that has taken up residence outside our bedroom window. And I said, that thing wakes me up every morning with its incessant racket. She said, Brian, what kind of woodpecker is it? I said, Mrs. Elrod, it's the annoying kind. I, I, don't, I don't know what kind it is. She said, would you describe its coat for me? I said, well, it has a, it has a solid red helmet and a bright blue chest. She said, it is a pileated woodpecker. I said, come again? She said, pileated. P-I-L-E-A, aided. There you go. She began to describe its nature and its demeanor. She said, Brian, they choose their homes. I said, I wish he'd choose to move. In the 1930s, the 1940s, Mrs. Elrod lived in the Carolinas. She had been hired by the United States government to take place in a top secret facility, a work that only a few dozen individuals on the face of the planet knew about. She had been given plot points of certain geographic rise and scope and it was her job to go into a secure facility every day of the week and draw for meticulous nature maps at that time of unknown origin and location. But she said the more plot points she was given, the more degrees of slope and rise she was shown, and the more points of latitude and longitude that were made available, the clearer the location of this map became. Eventually, she would realize that she had been given the plot points and geographic locations to draw maps, the beaches of Normandy, that would be used by the Allied forces to conduct the raid of June 6, 1946. It would be that in the understanding that this was her role, she was asked, what did it mean to you to know that you were taking part in that kind of effort? She said, it simply meant that I prayed. I prayed that what I had done was helpful that it helped to spare some men's lives. This was a woman who was well into her 80s before that, that piece of information of life had ever been revealed, who died into her 90s. And her greatest accomplishment of life, she would tell you, was loving the Lord. When you think about the things worth remembering in life, we can recollect on significant moments in our nation's history and past. We can see and we can be moved and marveled that there were men, 18, 19, 20, 21 years of age, who occupied the ranks of the greatest generation, who in reflection upon life realized that they were doing something that they believed they had been called upon in that time and in that era to accomplish. But in the grand scope of things, 
Our greatest calling in this life is to not be consumed by any one moment of history, but to rather let the sum total of our days be consumed by the fullness of being faithful to God. I don't know about you, church, but we have been called to be a kingdom unlike any other the world has ever known and seen. And for 150 years, the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has known a place in this place. What will it be like for the next generations to follow? The Bible says in Joshua chapter 4, when God had turned over the reins of leadership from Moses to the hands of Joshua, that Joshua would bring the children of Israel to the edge of the river Jordan. And he would cross over the river Jordan with the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And it would be that when they crossed over the other side, God had promised Joshua, Joshua, tomorrow I will work a mighty work through you so that all of Israel will know that I am with you just as I was with your servant, my servant, Moses. And so it was that when God parted the waters of the river and when those carrying the ark passed through on dry ground, solid ground, they stopped on the other side. Joshua would call to the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And he would say to them, Choose from among yourselves one, a representative from each tribe, and then come back to the river and pick up a stone from the river so that we might erect a memorial here in the middle of the river. For what reason? So that when your children pass by and they look upon those stones, they'll stop and say, what do these stones mean? Watch this. What do these stones mean to you? You think about the world that we're living in now, and you think about the nature of today. You think about so many times in your life when individuals see your life encounter difficulty or trial. Joshua was telling the children of Israel, here is how we will regard this significant moment in our life. We'll talk about how God provided for us from the past. When your kids come along and say, what do these stones mean to you? You tell your children, our God, your God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Father, is the reason why we're here today. He provided for us for 40 years in the wilderness. And during that 40 years' time, our shoes never wore out. And our clothes were never moth-eaten. Every need that we had, God provided for and made certain that we were secure. Here's what God has done for us in the past. Church, if anything, the generation of today needs to hear, it is how God has provided through difficult times in the past. Amen? We live in too much of a generation today that says it's too hard, it's too difficult, I ought not have to struggle. I ought not have to worry. I ought not have to have any difficulty. There's a Greek word for that. It's called balone. There is an idea that comes to your life and mind that says struggle is not anything that is greater than you so long as your God is living in you. We have a provision of the past and a narrative to tell us so. And Joshua was commanded, tell the children of Israel, look at these stones because somebody's going to come by and say, what does that mean? And now it's a teaching opportunity. Here's what God did for us to get us to this place. You think about not just the provision of the past, but you think about His presence in the present. Thus Joshua would go on to say to the children of Israel, we will defeat the Canaanites... And we will defeat the Amorites, and we will defeat the Perizzites, and we will defeat the Jebusites. And if there is any other ite that crosses our path, we'll defeat them too. Why? Because God is on our side. This is what God is doing today. This is what God is providing today. Oftentimes we look at God and expect that the answer to us be the answer that we are seeking. Whereas the answer is from God, one that perhaps you may not have been seeking, but one that will surely provide what you are needing. Not what you're wanting, what you're needing. 
God's provision in the present is such that He is not vacant, He is not void, He is not absent from our lives. Not only do you see His provision in the present, His presence in the present, but you see His promises for the pathway. The one theme throughout all of Scripture that is repeated more than any other theme is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I don't know about you, but future events of life, things that we cannot see, things that are unknown to us, are fearful events. And yet God is repeating throughout all of His inspired Word, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. And hear what else He is saying, be strong and of good courage, I go with you. Be strong and of good courage, I will never leave you. Do you remember the clarion cry repeated throughout all of the New Testament? I will never leave you nor forsake you. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Cast all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Don't want what someone else has. If I had their money, my life would be better. If I had their trust, my life would be better. If I had their love, my life would be better. If I had their job, their problems, their friends... Their family, my life would be better. Let your conduct be without covetousness. As it is written, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 4 and 5. There is a promise that a future day is brighter. A dear preaching friend of mine often quotes his father and says, The future is as bright as the promises of God. I believe that. I believe that God is working a mighty work even when I think He has forgotten how to work. God is working a mighty work. And it matters not whether I can see it, but whether I believe by faith He will provide it. Friends, He has yet to fail to keep a promise that He said He would keep. He will always be true to His name. You think about the nature of how you see this place and how you represent your lives because of this place. Some of your kids will pass by and they'll ask you, maybe not saying those words, what do these stones mean? But they'll ask you about that building. Or they'll ask you about that picture. Or maybe you take them to a cemetery and you point out names on a piece of stone and they'll say, who is that? The doors of opportunity are as wide as wide could be of teaching something of value. May I tell you some stones of remembrance very briefly before we say goodbye to one another for now. If you can give your children a stone of remembrance, I would tell you to give them a stone that says the generations will always pass and will always be challenged to set trends. But what you do with your life in meaning is critical. But don't believe in such an arrogant way that you are breaking a foundation or striking out a new mold like it's something original with you. Used to, young men would dress in certain ways that they would represent themselves as gentlemen. Now they sort of just wear pajamas, right? They just appear, here they are, and they think, well, this is trendy and this is cool. No, it's not. My grandparents used to dress like that. Uh, they, they, used to, they used to wear old socks pulled up to their knees. Uh, they used to wear old shirts that were wide open. They used to wear these long shorts that came right to here and black socks that came right to there. For crying out loud, I wear these kind of socks. It, it makes... It makes no real observation that life has come to any place that says, you're so original or you're so new. You think about the nature of how you see the world and the generation around you. The trend-setting individuals of today are not as trendy. These things repeat and circle and cycle through. These are not new things of the world. I give you the encouragement to see and to realize and to make known that we must recognize the truths that are always with us. God is to be remembered always and first. You shall have no other gods before me. Take a stone out of your river of life and remember this one, moms and dads. God is to be remembered first, always. There's to be nothing greater in your life than your service and your faithfulness to God. 
You think about how we have got to the place that we are in our world today, how we've arrived to the place that we are in our world today. It is clearly and plainly seen that God has been forgotten. The more He is renewed in your life, the better the world around you will be. You think about the nature of the world that we're in, we have a mission in Christ wherever we go. It does not matter where you move or where you live or what you do next. You have a mission in Christ wherever you go. Some have come back a long distance to be here today, and this is not called home anymore. Or it's thought of as the first place I called home. But it's not where you pillow your head at night. Regardless of where you've traveled, regardless of what your zip code is of present day, wherever you go in life, you have a mission in Christ. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Literally, as you go, your mission is to be in Christ. Don't come home to this place while living your life in every wicked and dark and ungodly way away from this place and expect everyone here to just reinforce the ungodly living in your life by recollecting how good you used to be. Don't let it be enough to rest on your laurels of I used to at one time be good. Wherever you go in life, you have a mission in Christ. You think about erecting a memorial stone. Living for God requires that you change your life and that change be seen in your life. Do you remember the image of Luke 15 and the prodigal son? The son says to the father, give me my portion of the inheritance. Literally, the son said to the father, Dad, I wish you were dead. Just give me what's owed to me. The Bible says a few days pass by, the father gives him his inheritance, and he goes away and squanders his wealth on prodigal living. Finally, the Bible says he comes to his senses and says, even my father's hired hands live better than I'm living. I'll go back to my father and tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. When the young man came home, came back to the father, you see the father running to meet the son. It was one of the most, one of the most indecent images that could have been painted in the New Testament narrative. Here was a royal father who lifts his royal priestly gown in order that he might show himself but also in order that he might have the ability to run. And he runs to the Son, and he embraces him. And he calls for a ring, and a fatted calf, and a robe, and shoes to be placed on his Son. A signet ring, to whereas if my Son says he has it, there is the proof that he does because he has my ring. Do you know what would have made the story of Luke 15 different? Is that if the prodigal son had returned home with the pig pen. In order for you to live for God, you must change your life. The great Marshall Keeble was once noted as saying he would go into towns and preach the gospel. Dozens, if not hundreds of people would obey the gospel and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. He would return two and three years later to the same places, conduct the same kind of meeting, offer the same invitation, and only a fraction of the people would respond. You know what he said? He said, the church done got in the way. They haven't lived for the Lord like they ought to live. And so they don't believe the message like they ought to believe, that it really can do what it says. Church, there's plenty enough obstacles in the world for people not to come to Jesus. We don't need to be one of them. Amen? Live for God. Change your life. You think about the nature of things that we need to remember. You cannot serve God and escape criticism. How well do I know that? Twenty years of preaching is how well I know that. You think about the nature of whether or not you're doing something or not doing something. Whether or not someone thinks you should have done this or should have done that. And while you've been doing this, they've come up with 15 other things that you ought to be doing over here. Listen to me. You serve God the Father. You give glory to the Son. And you are guided by the inspired Holy Word of the Holy Spirit. You cannot escape the criticism of man. But we are not here to serve man in the sense of pleasing them. We are here to serve man in the sense of showing them the grace and the glory of the Father. Live your life, and in so doing, 
embrace the criticism. Maybe it's revealing something you need to change. Maybe it's revealing something they need to change. At the end of the day, let it be said of you as the woman of Mark 14, you've done what you could. You think about the nature of your life, the past is a perfect guidepost, but it's a painful anchor. Far too many of us live in the state of self-pity of our yesterdays. We return to our lost way of thinking. Or we wallow in moments that God said, if you will bring that to me, I will forgive you. If you will bring that to me, I will make an overcomer in you. If you will bring that to me, I will remember it no more. But far too often of us live in our past. It's a great guidepost. It's a lousy anchor. There's a reason why you drive with the windshield and not the rear view mirror. Because you need to see what's waiting for you and what God has in store for you. There's sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. As far as the east is to the west, so far have I removed the transgression, the sin which is in you. When we start living like we are a forgiven people, our past will be that guidepost we need, and our anchor will be Jesus Christ, Hebrews 6 and 19. You think about the things that you need to remember. God must mean something to the faithful. He must mean something to you Monday through Saturday, because Sunday is already His. He must mean something to you on every other day that ends in Y. He must mean something to you so that the world knows there's something different about you. God must mean something to the faithful. His word must be His word. Do I agree with everything in there? No, but He didn't ask me to agree with Him. He asked me to honor Him and submit to Him. Do I acknowledge everything that is there? I better, or else His word will be that which judges me in the final day, John 12 and 48. God must mean something to the faithful. The reason God doesn't mean much to the world is because He's meaning lesser and lesser to the church year after year after year. He must mean something to the faithful if we want the unfaithful to ever come to know Him. The faithful must represent and show what God means to them. To the unfaithful, we don't need to browbeat, but we need to live faithfully in their presence so that when they see us go through adversity and trial, they see us praise the name of God, not ridicule Him. When they see us struggle in our lives, they see us rely upon God not backbite one another or tear God's reputation asunder. When they see us dealing with life's on, life on life's terms, they need to see us respond in a way of faith that, God, I don't know what you're going to do with this problem, but I know you'll do something greater than I can do. We must represent God to the unfaithful of the world if we ever want them to know Him. Be a light not a basket, Matthew chapter 5. We put a light on a lampstand that the world may see it so that we can glorify God and give Him the worthy praise due His name. You think about the nature of who we are and what we're to be, we need to see our way through our struggles. They make for a lasting foundation but a lousy focus. We need to stop living in the notion of the delusion that we must not ever, under any circumstance, ever be burdened by a struggle. We've lived in the generation of helicopter parents where they sort of circle around their children and try to remove every obstacle that they've ever faced, right? We give them a trophy for everything they've ever done. We give them a trophy for showing up. We give them a trophy for losing a game. We give them a trophy for not playing at all. We want to make sure that everything is good and right in their life. They don't ever encounter any kind of struggle. Now we've moved away from being helicopter parents, to now we're lawnmower parents. We mow down every struggle that our kids will face and encounter. We take away every problem that they'll ever go through. We want to lift every burden that they'll ever carry and face. And we've done that for about the last 15 to 20 years. And in the last 10 years, we have seen the issues and incidences of anxiety and depression and suicide skyrocket like no other time in our history. Why? It's because we've removed the notion and given the fallacy that you should not have to struggle. Tribulation produces character. Character produces integrity. Integrity brings us to hope, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. 
We are a people who need to see that our struggles may be great, but our God is greater. You think about the world that we're living in, you need to recognize and realize that wherever you are in life, you didn't get to where you are by yourself. The church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is all I've ever known. I can't recollect with you the names that you can recall of the last century and a half, but I can recollect names that have made every difference in my life. And I move to tears every time I think about them. And I think about the sacrifices they made to see something in the next generation. I think about the challenge that we face right now, bringing a generation in close to us. I had a young man in my office just this last week saying, if I could tell anybody anything, it would be how lonely it is to be a teenager. I said, tell me about that. He said, you have to have everything that seems to be trendy or else you're on the outside. You have to have everything that seems to be in or else you're out. You have to say the right words or else you're out. You have to drive the right car. You have to be on the right social media apps. You have to have the right phone. He starts clicking off all of these things. And he said, it's so hard. I said, you're right. It is. I said, can I tell you what it's like for old people to say the same thing you've said? What do you mean? I said, well, an old person would come in my office and tell me, you've got to smell the right way or you're not good enough for anybody. You've got to know the right words of today or else they don't want to talk to you. You've got to be able to move as fast as they can or else you're too much of a burden for them. You've got to be able to do all the things that they can do or they don't have time for you. You've got to dwell not so much on yesterday. You've got to be current and hip to today or else they don't want to hear what you have to say. Do you realize that in both of those worlds the, the theme of loneliness is existing? And what if we blended those two worlds together and we realize that through life we're not journeying alone? You make all the difference in your world when you recognize that you have one another. You'll also be better when you realize that external battles will be part of every journey. Joshua told the children of Israel, we're going to fight. We're going into the promised land and it's not ready to be ours yet. We're going to fight. And external battles will be part of every journey. Be of good cheer. You'll notice and recognize how to overcome. But an internal battle will put you at war with everyone. If you're always in that mood where somebody else is to blame for how you feel or what you think, you've blamed everybody for what you need to be responsible for. They should have never said this. They should have never done that. They should have never acted those ways. When you're battling internally, there is no peace. And so everybody's to blame for every bad thing. Above all these, if you take anything today with you, got to remember that there is no battle you'll ever face that's greater than your God. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I, the Lord your God, will go before you and I will fight for you, he tells Joshua. I will bring you to victory. Your young people will ask you a question at some point in your life. It may not contain the words, but I promise you it will contain the sentiment. What does this mean? If we dismiss them and say, hush, it's just the way we've always done it, get ready for them to find something more meaningful. If we take that as the opportunity to draw them by our side and say, let me tell you what God has done for us in the past. Let me tell you about the faithful brethren who you don't know, who they struggled just to get here, but they found their way here. Let me tell you about what God is doing in our world and in our lives today. And let me tell you that what God has promised for tomorrow always contains His presence. When you take the opportunity and the occasion to tell your young people, to tell all people, here's who our God has been, is now, and forevermore will always be, you're doing exactly what our God told us to do in every generation. Equip the next to know Him. It's our faith. The faith of our fathers, perhaps. 
But it's also the faith of our sons and daughters so that they will always know there's a God in heaven, a resurrected Savior by His side, and a Spirit to guide. The stones that are erected in the New Testament are slightly different from the twelve memorial stones of the River Jordan. In fact, it contains just one, the chief cornerstone, Jesus the Christ. His blood was shed for the sins of the world. His life was given so that all might know hope of eternal life. And His church was established that will never be conquered. In the next 150 years, this building may not be here, but the church of our Lord Jesus Christ will. She'll always stand until the Lord comes again. She'll stand even better when she has the faithful standing for her. Maybe your life has encountered something in the last few moments that you didn't anticipate or know. Or maybe you've seen a change come way in your days that you know you need the Lord's help. Perhaps this is just the right time to come back to the Lord because why not begin on a better day than today? We believe that Jesus is the Christ. We call upon you to believe in Him too. Repent of your sins. Confess His name as Lord. Be baptized to be forgiven. Don't be lost in the generation looking only to you. Be found in looking to the next generation and pointing them to the Savior. If we can help you today, make your need known. Be baptized to be forgiven. Restored to walk with Him. Come as we stand and as we sing.